Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming today to the Artist Talk. Uh, in conjunction with the exhibitions, we have Tom Cesar and Brian Bottle here. They'll speak about their work, themselves, their process, each other's work, and uh, then field your questions. So let's give a warm welcome to Tom and Brian. I am, uh, I went to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, um, started in the year 2000, and I got a certificate degree, and that was after a previous life as um, I was in the Navy, and I did some temp work, administrative temp work, and some um, um, work for a contractor for a while. Anyway, that led me to art school. And then since art school, I've uh, stayed at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and I'm, I'm now uh, working the uh, school exhibitions there. So um, it's been a very re rewarding um, second half of my life. So, And um, this is my work, and I was really, uh, it's really a pleasure to, um, to, have, to have Tina and Michael ask to be in the show and to be in the show with Tom. And, uh, I think it's a marvelous idea that Tina and Michael have put this work together. And addressing what's behind the work can be important. But I also want to kind of, I think most of the important things about what we could say about the work is actually you get from standing in front of the work. I mean, the purpose of a painting is really to hand an experience over to the viewer. Therefore, what's behind the work while important is is actually not quite as important as kind of what is presented through the work, what's realized in the work. The intentions that are realized in the work are the intentions that are there. The rest of them are sort of beside the point or um, it's, it's redundant to kind of address them sometimes. And actually that's one of the things I, I see in the works that are here. But, um, if you look, say, at these, it's, it's what they present to the viewer that actually excites me and interests me. The, the notion that, that these two works go together in a way because of the, the treatment of the space, the treatment of the colors, um, what, the, what the works borrow from something else in the world and return to you as the, in a generous way as the viewer, that's kind of consistent, right, with what we're doing? Yes. Um, interestingly, when I came here a couple weeks ago and looked at these, I realized that they actually address kind of the same issue in a way. And what Brian and I were talking before, we were talking about how we might address the titles of the work. But the notion that the one on the right is titled Misfit, and the one on the, in the other one with the squares here is titled um, uh, as if each has a knowledge of their own, is actually kind of about the differences, the individual differences in things, but the particulars of, of actually what's going on in the paint and the colors. And Probably, if you think about what, what is most salient in the work and how it connects to other things in the room, visual works aren't really isolated objects. They're really things that exist in conversation with each other, and they're really brought to life by the viewer, by, what's, by standing in front of them and seeing the particulars, reading the particulars of what's there. Um, but maybe we can talk about some other things for a moment. Well, I, the, the, I find that really interesting. Um, it's just kind of like the day-to-day -day crisis I have about what what's painting and like because I'm you know at school you're surrounded with people that are working towards some goal but they don't know what. And what mm -hmm. you just said that like these are just objects that have their own world and yet have to exist in a world in relation to other objects, which is really nice. That's what's nice about putting together a show. And it's just like, what's nice about having two artists come together, deliver some work, and then Mike and Tina like put, like arrange them in a way that's really quite compelling. I feel it's, it's not that I want to say that about my work, but I mean that it's so compelling, but I mean it's a really, it's, it's, it's a really solid, uh, 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 exhibition. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, because of what you just said, what kinds of things do you, kinds of things, do you learn from seeing the way in which Mike and Tina 
uh, present the work because it does make a big difference, you know, and maybe you wouldn't have put it up the same way. And when you see the way they've done it, what kinds of... Well, my experience, that's, that's one of my, uh, the, but I really enjoy um, when, uh, sometimes I'm given writer orders when I'm working on an exhibition and everything has to go up with someone else's vision and I just feel crushed. And then there's other times when they select the work that's going to be there and they walk away and I get to like arrange it. And you, um, and I also feel like there's no one answer to it, right? And so, so, but then what is interesting to see someone else's thing with our work is then to see how they picked up on certain aspects of it and did it maybe things that, oh, that's, oh, I can see that. Like I can see, how, you know, how the palettes relate with these, this group of paintings and how the structure relates with these over here or something like that. So it expands your vocabulary. Exactly. Yes. 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 And it, yes. And it's just like, just different, just, just like this ongoing, what do they use? You know, art is long, life is short, art is long kind of thing. And it's just part of the art is long thing of, you just get richer and richer every time you see right. like other people's inputs. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm laid with all of these, uh, the history of the work and the intentions I had, and it's hard to realize exactly what I, what I put into the work, what gets realized in the work, which is kind of my job, is to read it after I first make it and think about, oh, well, I kind of realized this part of what I was thinking but didn't realize that part. The opposite of that is, when they come and look at this work, they kind of see what's present there and can get it to interact in a way that I'm not sure we would have exactly. Um, first time I walked through the show, I thought, oh, we actually kind of deal with a lot of things the same way. And then I looked closer and I said, actually, I have kind of a, I step, my view of creating light in a painting is kind of stepping back a bit. I actually realized after a while that Brian actually steps closer to create. Uh, okay, I have much more of a sense is it, that I, I do, yeah. <laughs> And physically, actually, I feel the color of his paint, of his I feel the temperature of his colors much more emphatically than I feel the temperature of my colors. I kind of, like, you look at the light in the room, I can see what the light's like, and I kind of can address that mm -hmm. and borrow that and put it in my paintings and then reimagine it for someone else to look at. Um, there are parts of Brian's paintings where actually the temperature change in the color, almost physically as if I could put my hand there and feel the temperature change, is more present. It's more physical in that way. Um, it's just a different way of addressing what a color and a shape can do and what it can reimagine for the viewer when you pass it on. Well, do you feel that the fact of the different way in which the two of you put the paint down affects that? In how it affects color and how it's, whether close or far? The, um, yes, but I don't know how to elaborate on that. Um, <laughs> I mean, be, yeah, because I feel like some of, and some of yours, I think, are closer. Yeah. But then other times, I'm first involved in the gesture, mm -hmm. and then I get involved with what the color does. So th there's something first and something mm -hmm. second, and with Brian's, it's more the color is more the first thing I'm thinking about. And, and then the surface, because the surface changes in Bryant's to some degree, where there's a little bit more of the physical um, thickness or thinness that starts to change or blur that edge of color. So that makes the color change also. Is that, I mean, I don't know. I mean, but that's part of what I'm thinking when I'm looking. What? Uh, I think that you're similarly perverse in the um, arrival at um, spatial descents into the work. Like the things offer themselves as if they're going to be almost pure surface, you know, as I beat them. And then slowly, um, a certain kind of windows open, you know, uh, places where I can move through the surface back to another level and down back to another level after that. And I think you construct those opportunities in similar ways in the paintings. You know, um, 
despite the chromatics, despite the differences in handling, the arrival at something that um, is not exactly content to be surface alone, mm -hmm. and that the, um, in some ways the, the paintings are, are looking for the, the turning, I, I guess the easiest way to say it is um, they take a, the idea of a wall and go looking for a window. That's, that's yeah. um, so, like, just simply, you know, there's a, a kind of hierarchical read that sort of leads you. It stays pretty much on the surface, but once I get back to this part, I have a, a way through into a deeper space. And once I find the deeper space, then the space opens up in the more clotted foreground. And similar things happen in Brian's pictures, although um, not quite so readily, but I think I end up, you know, a, a passage like this, or um, in a couple of them, I think it's the, one of the pairing that's over there. There's a, it's the one with the yellow arc that moves up into the northeast corner. There's an establishment of something on the foreground that, that um, eventually um, steps forward a little bit unless other things recede and opens up the space. And there, there are moves that I think are painterly moves that you guys have in common for the most part. Well, I thought, when I was reading the titles actually, I thought at one point they could be switched between our works. <laughs> I mean, that's titled Blue Street, that could be titled Blue Street. That's titled Room of Revisions. Actually, your Blue Street could be titled Room of Revisions because they both address space and what happens in them and what happens when things are a little, when your vision blurs things as you look at them, when you take them in. The, um, yeah, I, when, I remember Murray Desner, I was sitting in the painting department office one day and Murray was sitting there. Um, and he, he's, I don't know, I don't, maybe there was a painting there or something, and he was saying how, like, that he, he was getting a sense of space from my painting. And, like, I, I don't, when I'm making that, I just, I don't get that. I don't know, there, hopefully that's something that's happening subconsciously or something, but everything is always, like, what's present on the surface. And Tom, I don't know, like if you're as you're designing your paintings and working on them, if you do have that sense of creating a spatial structure, or like my, my immediate concerns more: am I getting am I getting that shape right? Is that line right? I can go back in and draw it. Um, is is the temperature right? Is the chroma right? Kind of thing. And then the, somehow the space comes from it, but. Um, I don't for for the viewer though, then I don't know like where they, they do get a sense of space and because um, I think because uh, like as Jan was saying, I think you have more of a and what you said is that you have more of a sense of your span standing, you're 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 seeing your work from a different distance than I see my work. But making it oddly enough, making it closer up in some ways. Mm -hmm. To me, it's the light. To me, it's the light that creates the space, okay. and none of that's present in the painting. It all has to be constructed. It has to be constructed from how you address the surface. Yeah. And actually, I, would, I kind of reverse that idea that you look into the painting. I think the, the painting emerges off the wall, oh. in front of in front of what the surface is. Although, I, I mean, my experience in school, which was probably a little earlier than yours, was. Making a mark, making a paint, uh, making putting color down, and having somebody come up to me and say, "This was like uh, oh, 69, 72. You really don't want space there, do you? <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea that it had to be very flat, right. yeah. but not even. But and I kind of rebelled by not going in, but by coming, by making things come off the surface mm -hmm. as much as they mm -hmm. can, move toward you in the light, mm -hmm. and create a, a a notion of space through constructed light in the work, which is basically just an interaction of color, which borrows from what happens in the world and then shares it to the viewer in terms of, again, handing, handing an experience over to the viewer. I think what's really, oh, did you want to? No, go ahead. Um, you, to me, you construct these things the way, you know, it's the background, right? Mm -hmm. You, you are a builder of things, and you always have been, and you're mechanical. 
but where one thing butts up against the other. And that's that space right there that reverberates and gives the surface, really activates the surface. So, and yours in a different way, because you, with your brush strokes, that's how the surface is activated. But I think the biggest difference is the way it's, you, um, Brian's are built and constructed. Right, and then, does that make sense? It, 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 it does, and, and I like what Tom said about the surface, it not being so much a window, but as a, object that you then are trying to create this mm -hmm. you're trying to meet the viewer trying to come out of the viewer and like that i think that would be my ideal painting is, mm -hmm. is to have something come out at some without it like actually constructing yeah. molding you know molding something well, isn't the headlock atmosphere the painting yeah. creates its atmosphere but years ago uh, you know Spoken to somebody about it about the menu, and they said, Well, it's, it's not just the, the figure or whatever, but it's it's the, what it does to the air around it. And I think that's sort of with a painting, you can look at it, it, it creates this atmosphere that can pull you in, or you become part of that atmosphere. And, and atmosphere is both air and mood, or atmosphere is just kind of um, um, opening in space, air. Yeah. Like the room has an atmosphere. The room has air between the walls. Yeah. And it also I mean, has a... Each painting sort of can create its, its own atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of those things, I'll um, resist quoting some people, but I will quote Mike Boxdall, who talks about not the intentionality of the person making the work, but in the intentionality of the work, the intentionality of the painting is um, the forward-leaning look of things. Which, when I read his definition, that's his definition. The whole book called Patterns of Attention was about that. And when I read that, I thought, well, that's really stupid. How can? How what does that mean? Just, he just he just kind of lost what he was, lost his train of thought. Until I actually thought about what he wrote in the rest of the book in terms of the forward-leaning look of things. And I think basically he simply means it's what is most salient in the, in the work. You have all these things be, behind the work, but what's salient in the work, what's most, what leans out toward you furthest is what makes its biggest impression on you and gives you the experience of, of the work. I also think he kind of means, because he's an art historian, that it's the connection between the works, like the connection between the works in this room or the content, what you see borrowed in these works from other experiences in other paintings or in life in general, when, you know, what's borrowed from the way atmosphere and air and light and the temperature of things, the thought that you could go up and touch that wall across the street would have a certain temperature is part of what I see in your works as well as my works. Um, a, little, a little more in your works, I sort of feel like, oh, I should go touch that wall and really feel whether that wall is cold or warm, because buildings are sometimes warm, sometimes cold. I kind of get more of a sense of just the light coming off the building and how it's distanced mm -hmm. and, and how the atmosphere is reflected in the light and the experience of that um, for the viewer, which is, again, reimagined and then represented. You get, you get the opportunity to look at what Brian or I think when, these, when we experience physically these things. But it's not intellectual. It's really like having a body and having a life and you, you experience these things. And then you kind of say, well, this is the part of that experience I can share with you. And that comes across in as direct a way as possible, hopefully, for the person looking at it. And if it doesn't, then you go on to the next one and find something that does actually uh, reflect your interest, or reflect something that can be borrowed from the world and uh, reimagined for you to share in. So in the life cycle of a painting, like that, was, that would be the thing of like having these Having a kind of a semi-abstract and maybe even an, uh, a way of visualizing that kind of what you were talking about, just those objects that you're talking about is like the touch of something, the temperature of something. And then starting the painting and then, as I was saying to Mark, it's like, that, or we were talking to you, it's like, it just, no, oh, that didn't work out. And then this doesn't work out. And then like you kind of start, I, you can possibly, I, you know, those initial intentions that one had. 
I guess what you were saying is like these things are, these, this is an intentionality that's always there of what you're trying to create, right? You're always coming back to that same, those, that same goal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's how it gets realized in what you're doing. Yeah. So, well, so perhaps not, yeah. but hopefully some aspect of that's realized. So I'm talking like, I started talking about something very specific about what I'm going to do on this piece, as and this is a general idea of like what we and our backgrounds and our life experiences then, as you're working through a painting, eventually manifests itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll push it up just one step further. So you come in and you experience a word, and in a way, it asks you. What must I do next? Which is kind of perhaps a direction or maybe even an ethical question. Well, if, the, if, the world, if the world works this way, how do I have to respond to it? But it's not actually telling you what to do, obviously. I'm, I'm kind of being a bit facetious. What it is saying is consider if the world is constructed this way, if the world is reimagined for you this way, if the world's constructed this way, where should I place myself in relation to it in order to take the next step? Um, I mean, I, I actually, I mean, there are a lot of contemporary painters, I won't go into them, who really see the social and political aspects of painting abstract, uh, Julie Murray, Jack Whitner, abstract painters, who see their work in terms of political and social events. But I think all painting exists in that context. Sort of what, not telling you what to do, but saying consider this and then decide what to do, which is probably well, how many times in your life do you really say to something, do the, somebody do this and they do it? That really doesn't happen. What you're always really saying is consider what I'm saying as a, as a potential action and then do what you think is best. Um, uh, one of my favorite sayings at the moment, I'll end after this, on the side of St. Mark's in Venice, it says in a rough translation, uh, a man can speak and do as they think. And then a man can find out what the consequences of that are. Which is sort of an odd thing to put on the side of a cathedral, I think. It is facing the Doge's palace, I don't know what kind of interaction it is there. But when you reflect on that, that actually is saying, what are the consequences of the world being this way? If I, we reimagine, if the world is reimagined for you this way or this way, what are the consequences of that? Because in the end, it does have consequences. <laughs> I, I, I have uh, come across, and my, my uh, training, as much as I've tried, I just haven't had time to avail myself of a lot of, of the thought about this when I'm told that uh, painting is an ethical act, which like Rothko had said that, and a lot of, that's what they said that, you know, a lot of the critics in the 50s and 60s said that. And that, I don't know exactly what that means. And I guess that's because, because then, I guess you also have to live that, though, right? It's just not just like, it's not this ethical act up here. It's like an ethical act of day-to-day -day life. It's what, it's everyone acts ethically. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> Do other people have thoughts on this? <laughs> so I just want to pursue this because I think it's pretty fascinating. So if I take the two paintings that you're standing in front of, one by each of you, right? And they both have, um, for me at the outset, constructive or I would say even architectural propositions at their, at their core. And then both of them plot a way toward the, um, the dissolution of that architecture, or the um, the idea that the seeming inevitability of the architectural form is uh, mobile or fleeting. So both of you have like moments in the paintings, like yours are, are more sporadic, in which um, shit happens and things fall apart, or you know the the things prove to be hinged in different ways than you expected. You know, where something impossible, like being both behind and in front of, happens to destroy the, um, the rationality of the architectural conceit. You know? And so you could say that both of them are um, 
acknowledging that human efforts are made to try to, to make the world appear to be rational, but that inevitably the world acts back on them to unmake the, the sense of the, um, the wholeness of the structure that was proposed in the beginning. And that, in some ways, um, you could say that that's an, an ethical moment because it, it, um, it provides access to a kind of a truth, right? Whether you can say that that has consequences, whether these two paintings have consequences in the world, I think then becomes a matter of um, an individual onlooker, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, having a relationship with them. Yeah. And what you say is kind of tied to, again, this might sound overly simplistic. What happens if green works this way in relation to red? And what happens if green works that way in relation to red? Because they both deal with kind of a tension between things that are resolved and also still in conflict. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is called Siege, and this is called Books My Life is Red, which are mysteries and justice, books about justice, books about um, con human conflict, if you want to put it that way. Um, so, yes, it's interesting to me that these two work together that way. Yeah. I don't know whether Tina and Michael considered that or whatever. It, it might just simply be, again, how, how the colors balance or conflict mm -hmm. with each other. I have nothing to say, so I'll stay. Um, that's always, at this point, the best thing. Um, it's just, I was listening to Mark speak about the paintings from a perspective of painting and making something. And then, at the same time, you, one could also say, when they come into an exhibition, what, what's here of the world? Do, what, what of the world do I see here? What, what, and you've already spoken to that, both of you, anyway. But that relationship between um, a painting that we can see within the language of painting and a painting within which we can see the world, from my perspective, those two things are, are an important dynamic, back and forth. So you don't just see just the world or just the painting. And the thing I like about that when I hear the two of you is that one of you spoke of the work going in, and one of you spoke of the world, or the painting coming out, which meant that you both also had to deal with that place right here that went this way and that way. And so I think of that as similar. Now I know I'm giving a little bit of a lecture here, but how how wrong or similar or how interested are either of you in those kinds of things? But, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, those kinds of things. Well, what I that 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 relationship of the painting as painting or the painting as bringing the world to us. The world that we bring in. In other words, when I come in, if I don't see anything of the world in a work, if I look at work and I see nothing of the world, I'm only left with the painting. And I have to then understand it within the context of painting alone, which seems only half of what is possible. I really like I really like this, which because sometimes on my Sunday afternoons when I'm painting, and I'm. I might think of some, I'm thinking about some experience maybe that I had had yeah. uh, on, you know, did, did, you know, the sky was just right, there was this hill over here, there was this beautiful tree over here, and I'm trying to create that feeling in a painting. So that's great, that's the world, yeah. right? Yeah. And I'm just, I end up just being left very cynically and not really, it's cynical isn't the right word, with just painting. And that's actually, when I go and look at work, and when I look at this work, I mean, is, that's, that's kind of what I'm left with in my life. Like, the, that outside world is just fleeting, and I can't grab that, and I can't give that. That's like Stuart, like, names these, his, sometimes names his work just 
in these really wonderful things about walking down the street in, uh, in, uh, in some place, and, and I just look at it and I say, yes, that must have been just what it's like, but I can't do that. I just can't, I just can't grab that. And what I just am left with is, is the color, the texture, the, the you know, of, of the painting. And then I, a lot of times I, that's what I start out with looking at other work when I'm at a museum or when I look, and then sometimes you do get like those little insights, but it's, it's hard to bring the world in, I, some, I find personally, it's hard to bring the world into. Well, you can tell me if this is sort of the same thing. I can't imagine the world without painting, and I can't imagine painting without the world. I couldn't separate, I couldn't imagine them separ separated in a way. Is that sort of what you're saying? Which is the same thing as, mm -hmm. um, if you're looking into a painting, you're imagining a world that's been created away from you. And if you're looking at the surface, you're imagining, you're, imagining, you're paying attention to what's played. That's actually what it is there. That's what it is as an object. And then if you imagine it as coming toward you or you going towards it, then you're imagining this interaction which moves you in relation to it. Yeah, that makes so, sense. Yeah. I did because whenever I, I look at works, I always think, oh, what is it that I needed to bring here with me in order to be able to see these works? Mm -hmm. And you're just speaking to that. And I would take it a step further and say, from my point of view, the world doesn't exist. <laughs> I mean, it, it may not. There's, there's, no, there's no duality because this is this guy right it's here. only the painting. I mean, I wouldn't know what reality would be without a surface. You know, the, the world is just like random television screen or something. I mean, you know, the, like it doesn't really matter. The world, it's, it's the, our imagination is the transformer of our experience. So we definitely have experience, but I wouldn't even want to make the, the, the distinction between the world and painting because I don't know what the world is. But the world is better, but it appears to you. It's in front of you. It appears to you. I can't, I can't ignore the fact that it's in front of me, right? But it's so constant, like, well, oh, it's the world, the world of a strong sandwich, is the world of <laughs> exactly. It's the world of particulars, which is what these are about, the world of particulars. But it's about the particularity yes. of the very specific moment where the pigment stopped and the hand stopped and gave us this thing that really is the world. Well, um, Simon Kutcher wrote a book called Things Merely Are about the poetry of Wallace Stevens, and he says, Poets work with particulars. They tell you about this cup, this chair, this room, this moon, and they can only deal with the world through particulars. And what dealing with the world through particulars, reimagined does, according to Simon Critchley, maybe Wallace Stevens, is allow you to see the movement of the self in the world. That struck me. I don't know, again, what to make of it. Tom, that's, that's, but, that's wonderfully theoretical. When you paint, are you thinking of those of, of particulars? A particular landscape? A particular cup? A particular... No, I'm actually thinking of a particular color or surface and how it might, how mm -hmm. this yellow and this blue might create a particular physical feeling, affect is what I would call it, of something that responds both to to your physical and intellectual and emotional sense of the world. Um, and yes, but the strami sandwiches have to do with particulars. Politics has to do with particulars. Social, the way we interact has to do with particulars. If you do away with the particular, the um, Wayne Baskin's book uh, about uh, things that speak to us basically says, if things didn't exist in the world, it isn't that there'd be nothing. It's just there'd be kind of vague, mushy things. We wouldn't have a sense of where one thing stops and another thing began. The, the fact that we, our mind meets the world through things has to do with the fact that we wanted to find them and consider them just one step more specifically. Mm -hmm. Like if you imagine the world without things, kind of things mushed together. It, uh, and even atmosphere is a thing, I would argue. Is that going too far? No. <laughs> Stuart, you're always pushing too far. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't such a thing as too far. Oh, no, no, it's no, not far enough. Oh, no. okay. <laughs> then you haven't pushed too far enough. The mark is going to I'll push it a little bit further. So, so some of you um, might have read uh, a long time ago, Alice Huxley's Doors of Perception, which takes you to um, 
No, so he's tripped out on mescaline in a kind of organized fashion. He's got scientists around him of showing him paintings mostly, right? So he's looking at Giotto and things like that. And he, he realizes at some point that he's um, more fascinated actually by the folds in his trousers. <laughs> You know, uh, because they set up a condition of just being able to participate in this suchness, which is another way to talk about that undifferentiated state that you were talking about. And it occurs to him after like um, realizing, um, finding some problems in Cezanne, you know, and musing over Seurat and uh, Vermeer a lot, that um, when he's looking at people in the state, he's completely unconcerned with the people. And he discovers after the fact, when he's looking at his notes, that that seems to be a problem to him. This lack of concern for the societies and for the people that are um, that he lives among. And I think that this is where Michael was trying to go, like um, you know, about this kind of shutter movement between the idea of shutting off the brain valve, which wants to filter out, you know, the immense amount of information that our senses deliver to us. Um, in order to particularize it in the way that you were talking about, and still having this idea of an empathic response to the world, you know, which, um, which allows you to set up this kind of condition of being in the world ethically. It's just a, a way to start to think about like, the possibility of a relationship between the posture of um, complete absorption in the world of painting as painting and in, in formal elements and what it means to regard that this world is in a relationship with the world in which we walk around in every day. And I, I think that painters lie, and they lie um, especially to themselves, you know, about what their motivations are all the time. And so while you're thinking about the colors that you're going to use on the surface, you're associatively producing all of this other kind of um, material that's happening around you that tempts you, you know, into a different kind of gesture at any given moment. I just think that anybody that's a painter in here like knows that that is the way it goes. I don't think it's any you know. I don't think it's your the difference between your mind and my mind and Brian's mind or Patricia's mind or Michael's mind. It's just like Bernice's mind, who like is <laughs> the most non-representational of us all. I don't know if that's so true. I think my work refers to nature for sure and something internal. I go inside. So I think the outside reference is interesting to me to hear about everybody observing something when I believe it's internal for me, and that's where my imagery comes from. I mean, not to say that I don't observe nature and look around and I'm walking you know, down the street, I'm walking in the woods or wherever, and I see it all, but the images come from an internal place. <laughs> Also, in regard to that, um, we were talking before about how one of the important things is to think about how these things are always in transition. They're never really fixed for either of us. What, one of the odd things I realized in walking around the room is we both will paint something and then draw on top of it. I don't really know what that means. And I don't know why. Some people do that, some people don't. A lot of people won't. I don't know why. But, but I think what it speaks to is the notion that this has been done and now this can be done. Mm -hmm. um, well, that you can put a line out, you can cover the line, the line is still there, the line comes through, and then if you, don't, if you really think it needs another line, you can add another line. And it's, all, it's in transition. It's in a transitional state. So when you're comparing these things while you're painting, they're in transitional state, but it's just like walking around. And, uh, so if you're going to walk around the block here, you kind of think of what the transitions are and kind of what focuses your attention, what provides a culminating event to those transitions. You both put marks on top of things, yeah. but yeah. yours are more gestural and they feel like writing somehow, like the language that I see in some yeah. of these, where well, I, I think I said this before about how that line touches the next shape next to it and where those things butt up against each other and, and the tension of those two things is what I enjoy the most about your, your work. And so for you're, I feel more space in your in your work for sure. Mm -hmm. That you know, a deeper space that I can go back to, and almost like an interior mm -hmm. where you always feel more like a wall that's created. Brian, um, the beautiful surfaces. 
but it, it's some also, of them, some of them maybe go deeper, not as much. I it's feel also, like it's more like this. It's also about locating. I mean, look at how wonderfully this, well, this everything happens here, and then oh, well, what if I, what if I'm here? Which you, which I assume that came late, and you thought, oh, well, maybe I need to locate something here, and that's all. That's what you did, and it's just it's a beautiful way. So you stand in front of it, and you say, oh, there's a location there for me to attend to. I think I'm just staring at this painting too long, and I need to go oh. over here and look at some of these projections. <laughs> I think so. I you know this is. Well, yes, we're diagramming. It's not writing, it's diagramming. Right. Which is also another kind of consideration of the world. Right, right. And that's going back to how he builds things. I keep thinking of um, something that a little third grader said to me once many, many years ago, you know, that I taught a long time ago. And I had to, uh, I was trying to follow the curriculum that someone gave me, and I was supposed to explain to the children what the term point of view meant. Do you remember this story? Oh, a little bit. Well, okay. Um, so I kept talking and talking and talking. I was trying to talk about perspective and this and that. Of course, I was a young painter, so perspective meant a lot to me. And the more I talked about these words, point of view, I could see this one little girl named Kate who was like really smart. And she was looking at, she just had this look and knew that she didn't understand something was missing here. So I went to the blackboard and I wrote the words point of view. And she looked and she went, oh, I thought you said point of view. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, you're right. <laughs> And that's what perspective <laughs> in the small and the large world really is. And I'm thinking of Alice in Wonderland and all of these, and stepping through the looking glass that an artist puts up. And even she had <laughs> her own point of view that she tried to apply in that world. And in that, when I was thinking about this with the ethics that you were talking about, none of it made any sense. What came back to her was contrary to what she'd been brought up to believe. That's actually a separate story. But that sense of point of view is something that I've obviously never forgotten because that was about 58 years ago or something that she said that. But I thought it was germane. Well, thank you.